Thank you for joining us for this important conversation around mental health awareness for the neuromuscular community. Being aware of your mental health has been amplified during this pandemic, and we think it is important to speak about mental health in our community regularly. I'm Justin Moy, and I'm excited to be moderating today's conversation. I am a member of the MDA community and I'm an alumni MDA national ambassador. I'm currently a member of the class of 2022 at Worcester Polytechnic Institute studying bioinformatics. I'm honored to be joined today by Mindy Henderson and Mary Holt Pallone. Mindy is the director and editor in chief of Quest Content at MDA. Mary is the mental health nurse at MDA's ALS Care Center at Temple University. We are so happy to have you both here today. Excited to be here. Thanks for having me. Same. Thanks so much for having me. Glad to be here. <laughs> we are thrilled to have these experts with us today. Please understand, though, that they are not providing medical advice during today's program. Any decisions about your care should be made in conjunction with your medical professionals. We look forward to spending the next half an hour answering your questions. But before we dive in, I would like to thank our generous event supporters, Mitsubishi Tanabe Pharma America Incorporated, Genentech, and Amelix Pharmaceuticals. So to start off, uh, Mary, can you share with us uh, what is mental health and what does mental illness really mean? Absolutely, Justin. Great question. I'm glad we're starting here. So mental health, it's really one of the most important parts of our overall thriving and our overall health in general. The CDC states it um, just very basically as involving our emotional, psychological, and social well-being. Our mental health really helps determine how we handle stressors, how we relate to others, and also how we make choices throughout our lives. Now, thinking about the second part of your question, I appreciate this as well because the clarification with mental illness is really important. There's often a stigma and some there can be some shame around the term mental illness, which often can be associated with the psychoses or really seriously deranged. Um, but really, if we just consider the word illness, it really simply means just a disease or period of sickness that affects the body and the mind. So a physical illness can be anything from a mild cold to really all the way to a life-threatening condition. And mental illness is very similar. The American Psych Psychiatric Association defines it simply as a health condition. A health condition associated with distress that affects one's emotions, thinking or behavior, and create problems uh, functioning in life. So these can range from mild adjustment reactions to life circumstances, all the way to the more serious psychoses that I mentioned previously. It's interesting to note as well that many of us, if not most of us, at some point in our lives will fall into this mild, moderate end of the spectrum of a mental illness at some point in our lives. And also, it's helpful for people to know that these are very common and really very treatable. Mm -hmm. And Mindy, coming from a different angle, I know that you are a motivational speaker and an author. So can you share with us, uh, what does it mean to have positive mental health and how do you maintain that mindset? It's a great question. For me, having positive mental health means having a relatively steady mindset of looking at the world, looking at ourselves, our lives, the events in our lives, the good and the bad, and the people in it with some level of optimism, of hope, and of humor. And when things go wrong, while it's healthy to, of course, feel any emotions tied to it, you know, do we dwell and fester? Um, and let those things take over our thoughts. And if the negative thoughts are taking over or we can't find anything to be grateful for, that's probably a sign that our mental health needs some, some TLC. And personally, I've used a few different techniques to help me remain positive in my outlook on life. The first being a gratitude practice. You know, the science shows that if we actively write down a handful of things every single day in the past 24 hours that we've had to be grateful for, we can 
almost essentially rewire our thinking and the way that we respond to things in our lives. The other thing that I've done a lot of is meditation and journaling and more intentionally trying to be aware of my thoughts and replacing when I notice more negative thoughts creeping in, trying to replace them with more positive thoughts. Definitely, definitely. That makes a lot of sense. Um, but oftentimes in the neuromuscular community, there are challenges and barriers uh, when it comes to mental health and having good mental health. So Mary, can you talk to us a little bit about the challenges that individuals living with a neuromuscular condition face? And what are some specific considerations for that community on mental health? This is a really great question. Um, and there can be many barriers. Like you said, there can be lots of challenges uh, depending on the situation, for sure. And research does show that, you know, over the last 10 years, this has been studied more in terms of mental health with neuromuscular diseases. And about 75% of those living with neuromuscular diseases do report some form of psychological symptom, um, including stress, depression, anxiety, are certainly at the top of the list. So some of these challenges um, specific to this group, uh, those living with neuromuscular disease, really includes, of course, the medical and, the, and just the physical issues particular to your own condition that can be really ever-changing and often progressive, um, continually trying to keep up with those changes and deal with that. Potential care needs throughout life, uh, which can also really be um, quite a challenge, and especially over these last two years with the pandemic, you know, access to care has been a huge issue for people in terms of being isolated, um, not being able to get care into the homes. The chronicity of the condition, just living with a chronic illness for a number of years, effects on self-image, esteem, self-esteem, self-efficacy, really feeling like a sense of independence, also working with issues of dependence, socialization, isolation, mm -hmm. you know, financial challenges, living with a chronic condition and the financial burdens that can occur with that schooling, uh, support mm -hmm. uh, of, of all forms. And then also considering too, and this list of course is not exhaustive, but also considering the cognitive changes that can, that can go along with some of the uh, neuromuscular diseases. So these can all lead to increased stress, depression, anxiety, possible ineffective coping. And really the major consideration or one of the major considerations from my perspective is that mental health really needs to be part of that care continuum and part of the discussion with our families from a clinical perspective and also really needs to be a priority for people in terms of taking care of their mental health. Mm -hmm, definitely bringing in those conversations regularly with professionals, but also being able to advocate uh, to those professionals. So Mindy, can you share with us some of the strategies uh, or tips that you have on number one, advocating for mental health care, um, the importance of self-advocacy and in general, establishing a positive support system? Absolutely. I think, first of all, you know, there, there can be some shame, like Mary said, a lot of people feel, um, a, you know, some element of shame if they do need to seek help or counseling. And I believe with all my heart that healthy people get therapy and there should be no shame. In fact, I'd venture to say that in today's world, there are probably more people in therapy than not. And as for advocating, I would say to know that first and foremost, you are worthy of happiness. And though I would hope that we all have people in our lives who contribute to our happiness, unfortunately, no one else is responsible for our happiness but ourselves. And so it's really critical that we know when our mental health is suffering and proactively and intentionally and critically seek the help that we need. And I say critically because you may have to meet with a few therapists before you find the one who you have the right chemistry with and who you feel like has the right experience and credentials to be the right person to help you. 
And you may also have to have a converse, have conversations with your therapist about cost and insurance. And those can be awkward conversations to have sometimes, but it may be incumbent on you to own turning in paperwork to your insurance company for reimbursements, things like that, you know, benefits that you're entitled to with whatever insurance you may have. So that's another thing that you really have to be assertive about and know that it's not your therapist's job. You have to be responsible for enduring or ensuring that proper billing and reimbursement happens for you. And as for positive support systems, making sure that you have people in your life who you can talk to. You know, humans are not meant to do life alone. We need social interactions that are positive and sometimes we have to sort of audit our relationships and make sure that they're healthy, that they're enhancing our lives and not making things worse. I've had friends in the past who, you know, all we did when we got together or spoke was to complain and commiserate together. And at some point I realized that wasn't healthy and that the relationship didn't bring me joy. It just reinforced and validated how wrong everything was. And I had to say goodbye. And while that can be hard, it also makes room for new people who will hopefully be more of a positive influence on you in your life. Mm -hmm, definitely encouraging those positive emotions. Um, but oftentimes too, on the flip side of that, there's depression, stress, anxiety, and isolation, um, all of which we hear so much about, especially as our community continues to go through the pandemic. And this spans across all ages, adults and children. So Mary, can you share what the signs and symptoms are of these uh, important issues? And when should somebody seek help? Absolutely, absolutely, great points. Um, so certainly it's important to note that the signs and symptoms can really vary, can really vary from person to person. They can vary from age and development. Uh, so we want to be mindful of that. But there are some basic similarities that we can be mindful of. So for depression in particular, feeling sad often or all the time, if you yourself or if you're aware of someone else that you've just noticed this or you notice this within yourself, um, it, you know, lacking motivation, not really wanting to do things that maybe once used to interest you, um, not finding mm -hmm. interest in things that used to please you in the past, changes in sleep or eating behaviors, uh, increased physical pain that can also go along with mm -hmm. uh, signs of depression, trouble concentrating, feelings of worthlessness, helplessness, certainly thoughts of harming yourself. Um, they all can kind of go along with depression. Depression. Now for anxiety, we are looking for more those kind of racing thoughts, that restlessness, um, obsessive behaviors. Sometimes people look fine on the outside, yet they feel panicky or restless. They describe that they feel restless on the inside. Um, panic attacks, full-blown panic attacks certainly is an issue um, and a clear sign. Trouble breathing, that's another thing. If people have shortness of breath, they feel like they can't get enough air in. Now that is, I just wanna point out that that would be unrelated necessarily to your medical condition if your respiratory function is affected by your neuromuscular disease. This is kind of outside mm -hmm. of that. Um, and then being mindful of, you know, age. So children will, can manifest in different ways. So you want to watch for children, um, you know, school performance if they're in school. Has the school performance changed? Have their grades changed? Are they acting out or having tantrums in some way? Has the behavior changed mm -hmm. dramatically? Um, and then as far as when to seek help, I really tend to err on the side of prevention and uh, caution in this. You know, once we get to crisis, if we can prevent crisis, that would be wonderful. So I always err on the sooner the better. Um, mm -hmm. But really, I mean, if anyone, if you're experiencing any sort of distress that is in interrupting or affecting your relationships, affect, affecting your quality of life, affecting your sleep, affecting your uh, productivity, your happiness. Certainly it is, it would be, I would certainly suggest just reaching out even just for an evaluation. Um, yeah, and I, I really think that extra support can always help no matter what, it's never too early.
<laughs> yes, building that support network. And on that, Mindy, uh, could you give us some tips on how individuals can remain connected to others and uh, maintain those relationships that are so important? Absolutely. And, you know, I, I think that the the pandemic has has, you know, been been a bit of a, um, a help and a hindrance in this area. And I, I think that the first thing I want to say is that, you know, texting and emailing are not human interactions. And so, you know, I, I say that with a smile on my face, but in all seriousness, we need contact. Mm -hmm. We need to hear a person's voice, to see their face. To, uh, so, you know, I, I encourage people to get back on the phone, you know, and make phone calls, have regular conversations with people who feel good to talk to. And, you know, mm -hmm. Zoom and other conferencing tools are amazing tools that everyone uses these days for keeping connected. Mm -hmm. You know, if you live far away from other people or for whatever reason, you can't get out to see people it's a great option. And, you know, I think we all have learned over the course of the last year or so that being at home all the time just isn't healthy for our mental health. And we've all mm -hmm. done so much of that during the pandemic. So, you know, obviously be safe, be careful, social distance, wear your masks, but get out whenever you can and go outside, go sit at a coffee shop and, you know, just interact with people, even if you don't know them being around people is is a great form of therapy and i also think that the sun is therapy so being outside <laughs> in nature and experiencing that is going to be good for you definitely and mary would you like to expand on this question too uh absolutely yeah thanks for asking i mean i certainly agree with everything that mindy said and again research shows that social connections are one of the key factors in people's overall quality of life. People that have social interactions, healthy social interactions, actually live longer. So mm -hmm. a lot of what she said, you know, our virtual world is well established these days. You know, we can even, you know, now we have telemedicine and we can contact our physicians and stay in touch that way, even though I realize it's not perfect. I certainly advocate for the in-person connections as much as possible. Um, and as Mindy was saying, I've even, you know, I encourage people to write some letters, you know, reach out to other people that if you notice that someone else is on the quieter side or if you, you haven't heard from them or maybe they're isolating, who knows, that we can always then reach out and see how they're doing as well. Um, so just mm -hmm. having it go both ways can be really helpful. Mm -hmm. And so again, you talked about writing letters. Uh, again, our world is so high paced, high stress. So what are some strategies uh, that you have to reduce these feelings of anxiety and stress? Well, this is a hugely hot topic and a topic that I love um, in terms of how helping people manage their stress. So certainly one of the best and oldest tools that is used that is housed right within us is our breath now bearing any respiratory conditions with your neuromuscular disease um, i work with a lot of people that do have various mod that need various modifications when we're working with the breath but really just using our breathing and slowing down our breath mm -hmm. taking pauses throughout the day um, longer taking longer deeper slower breaths down regulates, physically down regulates the whole system, physically, emotionally, and mentally. Our blood pressure calms down, our mind can calm down, all sorts of things. So, and then, you know, using a pause, um, just pausing throughout mindfulness tools, meditation. And uh, I know Mindy mentioned that. And I have to say, meditation, one of the reasons that I love meditation is because it really spans any physical capability whatsoever. You don't have to be able to do anything physically to meditate. And I work with a lot of people that have lots of different limitations. So meditation mm -hmm. can be a great tool. Um, it's a practice for sure. Positive self-talk, movement, um, even just thinking about doing some movement can actually downregulate the system. Sometimes medications are needed, you know, antidepressants, anti-anxieties, there is a real place for those if the body is just too mm -hmm. overwhelmed to be able to manage it itself. So I always encourage people, just if you have questions, just please reach out if we can help. 
Mm -hmm. And Mindy too, could you share a few of your strategies that you have for dealing with anxiety and stress? Yeah, absolutely. Honestly, I, I think that, um, th I, I agree with Mary. I think that between she and I, we've, I, I just want to reiterate a couple of them, you know, journaling for me has been hugely helpful over the course of time. Um, you know, doing something like setting a timer for even five minutes mm -hmm. and just dumping out every single thought that occurs to you over the course of that five minutes. Even if you're writing down, I don't know what to write next. It's just a question of getting all of that noise out of your head and down onto a piece of paper that no one else is gonna see, but you. Um, so I think that journaling um, can be really effective. That's just one way to journal, of course. You know, calling a friend and having, um, you know, a, a, a conversation that will either cheer you up or where you can just call someone and, and laugh for 20 minutes um, is, is always a good option. And then, like Mary said, um, meditation is fantastic. And there are apps out there that I've used personally that are free, that are fantastic. A lot of people have used, um, have talked about Headspace. There's another one called Calm that I love a lot. So if you look around, you'll find a lot of meditation apps um, to help get you started. Mm -hmm. uh, and oftentimes during meditation, right, you want to listen to that internal voice, but also too, it's important to have an external voice. And often we hear that individuals don't feel like they have a voice or feel a sense of loss of control over their circumstances, specifically when you have to navigate your own disease and including the pandemic too. So Mary, what are some recommendations that you have for helping people find that voice and work through their emotions? This is a real and very significant issue for people, um, especially people living with neuromuscular diseases, having to navigate physically and emotionally uh, this life journey. So I certainly would put a plug in here for um, professional support, uh, professional help to, yeah, to explore emotions, to find strategies, whether it be through a counselor, a therapist, a coach, a social worker, um, that there are people there that can help you do this. Um, but also, too, just from a practical standpoint, um, persistence. Persistence, of course, is needed. And when that can be a difficult challenge, of course, when you already feel maybe exhausted or fatigued from your condition. Um, but we all know how many times you have to call the insurance company to appeal the medical device that wasn't whatever approved. So actively, you know, surrounding yourself as much as possible as well with um, people that really support and build you up that your voice is important and needed and necessary and heard. Mm -hmm. And again, on that support network, uh, it's so important, and part of that support network is the caregiver and the loved ones. Uh, and that's essential in the lives of individuals who are living with a neuromuscular disease. Um, and just as important is the mental health of caregivers and loved ones. So, Mindy, why is it important for caregivers to focus on themselves and their mental health during this time? Honestly, it's that metaphorical ox metaphorical oxygen mask. You know, if you don't take care of yourself, regardless of, of who you're tasked with taking care of, um, you're not going to be able to as effectively take care of someone else. So taking care of yourself physically, emotionally, all of the ways that we need to take care of ourselves and filling up our own cup with things that make us happy will position you so much better to give you to give care to someone else mm -hmm. and mary on that note what are some specific strategies that caregivers can use to help themselves and continue to be a positive support for their loved one absolutely so first and foremost really acknowledging that it is okay you actually do deserve and it is okay that you take care of yourself um, that you care for yourself so you can care for your loved one. And I oftentimes will suggest to people that if you might be someone that forgets that from time to time, <laughs> or maybe feels like it's not okay that you take care of yourself, to actually just write that, write yourself a little note on a sticky and 
put it up on your mirror somewhere so you see it every morning, you know, in some kind of kind words that it's okay to take care. Yes, um, I, I do deserve to take care of myself just as a nice little reminder. And some of the strategies that we've talked about managing our own anxiety and stressors uh, applies here too. Um, but in particular to caregiving, you know, one thing that can be really helpful or some things that can be really helpful, uh, delegating, sharing the care, asking for help. What's that like? Asking for help, um, you know, taking time for yourself. We talk about that all that time. And I realize that time is of the essence for caregivers. And we feel like we might feel like we're, we don't have enough time. Um, I do try to empower people and help them if they are taking able to take time away from their the one that they are caring for that they do something that they enjoy like mindy talked about like something that nurtures them not necessarily a house chore like filling up the cars with gas or going to the pharmacy that it's actually something nurturing <laughs> for them and all these things like being outside in nature um you know connecting with others, exercise, movement, support groups, um, finding laughter, seeing a movie, whatever it may be, finding quiet time for themselves to start each day. Um, and then I really do try to stress uh, gratitude practices as well, like Mindy had mentioned, but also um, just the basics, the basics. Are you mm -hmm. seeing your own doctors? Are you drinking water throughout the day? Are you eating <laughs> sufficiently and nutritiously? You know, are you getting any sleep? <laughs> you know, things like that. Mm -hmm. um, can you breathe out just a bit? You know, uh, so we really do just try to address the basics and it's amazing the difference that makes. Mm -hmm. So we've talked about a few different concrete strategies that you can use to uh, help with your mental health uh, as well as the importance of speaking to professionals so i guess more generally mary uh, <laughs> what resources are available to support someone's mental health and if someone wants to talk uh, to a specialist or a clinician who can they reach out to all right well the first part is that there are tons of resources we live in a world right now and in a time where there are so many resources to help us, whether we want to do it individually, whether we want to reach out and do it with people. Um, there are online support networks. There are books, webinars, tapes. I mean, mental health is such a hot topic right now. So I couldn't even begin to list all of the resources. And I know that we have some resources and links that are will be listed in the chat. Um, so there's a ton of resources. Um, please feel free to email me if anybody has any questions that's, you know, tuning into this or sees this later. You can certainly ask me if you need resources or have questions. Um, so, and a really important part is what you had asked about when somebody, if and when somebody is willing and, and ready to talk to someone or seeks, wants to seek support, what do they do? Um, so there are several options for this as well. I would suggest that someone start with, you know, just somebody that you feel comfortable with in your community, possibly, whether it be a parent, whether it be um, a, you know, your family doctor or your neurologist, mm -hmm. possibly someone that you feel is trustworthy. Maybe it's a school counselor or a guidance mm -hmm. counselor or a teacher at school, something, um, and maybe they can make a referral for you. Another avenue is that you can um, certainly check your insurance companies, like Mindy alluded to previously in the discussion. You can, they can give you a list of providers that are within your network. Um, so there's really lots of different um, ways to find resources. And I always do encourage people that and let people know that it is totally within their right your right to interview a therapist or a counselor mm -hmm. or a coach interview them see mm -hmm. if they have um what you're looking for you know do they have mm -hmm. not that this is absolutely needed but do they have experience whenever, whenever i'm vetting a therapist for someone else a referral um do they have background or experience with chronic conditions you know with grief mm -hmm. and loss potentially because that can go along with things so ask these things, not that they're absolutely necessary, but they can be well-informed to better support you possibly. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. Um, and again, uh, thank you for pointing out, we have a lot of great resources in the chat, um, but we are getting close to the half hour mark. So Mindy and Mary, before we wrap up, is there anything else you would like to share that we did not have a chance to cover today? 
Absolutely. I think that just knowing that we are all on this earth living a human life and that we're not alone. All of us have bad days, challenges, and hard times, and you're not alone in that. And there's no shame in saying that you're not okay at the moment. Your honesty, I think, will help others open up and you'll see exactly how not alone you are. So just be aware of how long you've felt that way and know when it's been long enough, you know, work through it, but don't set up camp in a negative place. And if you're having trouble breaking free of the darkness, reach out to people who can help. It's why they're there. Mm -hmm. And Mary, did you have any other points that you wanted to touch upon? Well, first, I really wanted to thank you, Justin, um, just for moderating this discussion. It's really been lovely. And uh, I, I also really want to acknowledge that, you know, of course, living with a neuromuscular disease, I don't do it personally. I've worked with uh, neuromuscular disease, you know, families for a number of years, can be incredibly complex um, on so many levels. And that, you know, so people know that absolutely our mental health and our emotional well being directly affects our physical and medical well-being. So mm -hmm. it is a connected loop that if we're already living with a neuromuscular disease, we want to be absolutely mindful, even that much more mindful of our mental health. So they are common, they are treatable, absolutely. If you have issues, it is okay, and you absolutely deserve to just feel good. So please reach out if you need help. Thank you so much. Uh, Mindy and Mary, that is all the time that we have for today. Um, but I would like to encourage those of you watching to take a look at the resources shared today down in the chat and be active in supporting your mental health. I would again like to thank Mitsubishi Tanabe Pharma America Incorporated, Genentech, and Amelix for their support of this Facebook Live program. Thank you again for attending today's Facebook Live event on awareness to mental health. And if you are unable to join the full conversation, the recording will be available for playback on Facebook, as well as mda.org. Mindy and Mary, I would again like to thank you both for joining us today and sharing the great information that you did. Thank you. It was thank a you. pleasure. Thank, thank you. you. <laughs> and thanks, MDA. <laughs> As a reminder, please understand that they are not providing medical advice during today's program. Any decisions about your care should be made in conjunction with your medical professionals. Please stay tuned for additional community updates through MDA's website, as well as on MDA's Facebook page. Thank you again for joining us today, and remember to take care of you and your mental health.